Hey there, boils and ghouls. Welcome to this week's episode of Hollow Weekly, where George and I interview John Paget, the author of The Secret of Ventriloquism, named best fiction book of 2016 by Rue Morgue Magazine, and as well as the 2016 Golden Ghoul Award. That is a tongue twister. Golden Ghoul Award. <laughs> for fiction. And if you're like me and you think ventriloquism and dummies are uh, inherently scary, and on top of that you like short horror, well this book has everything just for you. So have a listen and enjoy. I think I saw in an interview you said you started uh, 20 Steps, uh, I mean, how many years ago? Um, the first draft of that story was written in 1994. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's been a long, <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> Um, so the, the, first, the first version of that story, you wouldn't recognize it now. It, it, it was, it had nothing in common with what it became later, uh, except for a ventriloquist dummy was in it. Um, <laughs> and that's but it. That, yeah. well, that was it. That was it. And it was called The Eyes of the Master. And um, I wrote it uh, because I was inspired by the work of Thomas Ligotti, um, who I started reading about 91 uh, and, and and whose work I completely um, just was blown away by. I've got um, his Peng Penguin Classics right in front of me, actually. <laughs> time. Yeah. I love it. He's, hmm? A long road from there to then now. Uh, at, at the time, uh, Ligotti was known by the, the hardcore, small press, weird fiction readers uh and, and and did you know uh uh at the time kind of break into the larger publishing world uh with robinson and carolyn graf mm -hmm. but he was not widely known uh at all and um and he was the first writer whose work i read that made me want to be a writer because uh, in his stories, for the first time, I, I was reading work that really spoke deeply and personally to me that I felt mm -hmm. like, you know, if, if, if I could write, this is what I would write. Um, <laughs> or this is what I would try to write. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, a few years after I wrote this, this thing, you know, I was pretty happy with it. I didn't know any better but to be really happy with it. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I got in touch with uh, Ligotti. Um, first, I created a, a Usenet group, um, and, and I was practically the only person um, on Alt Horror Cthulhu <laughs> uh, <laughs> that uh, thought that creating a news group just for Thomas Ligotti was a good idea. <laughs> uh, the the only other supporter was a man by the name of Matt Carden, um, who oh, he, he wrote the introduction to your book, right? Yeah, yeah, and and he's also an incredible uh, writer, both of uh, uh, weird fiction and uh, nonfiction as well. Um, sure, he, he's he's written a a couple of collections. One is about to come out. Uh, he just finished editing this huge encyclopedia of horror, um, which just looks incredible. And uh, oh, cool. we're coming out with an omnibus at the time. But when we met uh, on Usenet, um, uh, he had not published anything. Of course, I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, Shortly after that point, I created the Thomas Ligotti online website. Um, and this would have been back in late 97. Um, then in early 98, uh, I contacted Ligotti by email for the first time. I actually guessed his email address. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's amazing. Which I was hoping wouldn't be too creepy for him. <laughs> I wrote a long, uh, a long email that I really did not expect to get a response from. Sure. Uh, but he responded to me and actually said that he had been, you know, watching all of my, uh, all of my online actions <laughs> of trying to, to get support for the Usenet site and then the, the website. Mm -hmm. um, and we started correspondence. Um, which which turned into uh, for for a long time uh, daily uh, correspondence by email, but also the occasional uh, phone call or or mail. And anyway, I sent him this story, mm -hmm. um, and, and my girlfriend at the time, now my wife of uh, nearly twenty years, um, she was the first person to tell me that uh the story was garbage <laughs> <laughs> and in no uncertain terms and uh but i i still you know i thought well she just you know doesn't understand weird fiction sure um, and uh which is was baloney um, <laughs> <laughs> the lies you have to tell yourself well, she fine. understood good writing and bad writing from the beginning um sure She's a, she's a poet. <laughs> oh, cool. And now a, a creative writing and English uh, professor. Oh, awesome. In New Orleans. Um, but I sent it to, to Ligotti and, uh, and he was, he was very kind, but he, <laughs> he told me in, in, in so many words that, you know, this was, this was a pastiche uh, of, his work and Edgar Allan Poe's work, kind of a hybrid. So past, pastiche is Thomas Ligotti's word for garbage. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, well you know, he, 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 he made it clear that this was, you know, this was my <laughs> kind of gesture. He appreciated it. Um, mm -hmm. But at some point in our friendship, as probably, probably uh, within the next year, I told him, you know, hey, I, I just want to write a good story. So could you just take the kid gloves off and give me your real feedback on this? And, and he definitely did. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, you know, I, I thought that um, I thought that my my girlfriend had given me a hard time, but I had no idea. He completely <laughs> annihilated the the story i mean he dissected it told me everything that was wrong about it and you know by the end of that i didn't want to ever write again sure um, but it kept on happening i kept on picking up the pen again and i kept on rewriting the thing and sending it back to him and periodically the same thing would happen um and I felt like I wasn't making any progress, but years started to go by with this thing. Um, and, uh, and finally, in about, and you know, once or twice a year, I'd rewrite the thing and send him, uh, it, and, and he would destroy it. Um, and, uh, and finally, in 2004, I, I kind of had an epiphany. Um, you know, he had said for a long time, you know, the, the, the element that you really need to focus on is what you know about that not many other people do know about. Um, and that element is ventriloquism. Um, so I started focusing on that aspect. And, um, and, and in 2004, um, I, I started thinking, uh, I went deep back into my own experience um, as a ventriloquist. Uh, I started uh, ventriloquism when I was nine years old because I was terrified of ventriloquist dummies, um, <laughs> which sounds strange, but... No, it doesn't sound strange. No, <laughs> that, makes, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> kind of my take on, the, on them, too. <laughs> Before that point, I was terrified of dolls. Um, probably the the genesis of that was 
seeing the Night Gallery episode, The Doll, when oh, I was yeah. uh, four years old, which is an Algernon Blackwood adaptation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and it scared the hell out of me. I had, I had, in fact, I had nightmares almost every night about this thing for years in my childhood. And then wow. once, I got, once I got over that, I, you know, almost like clockwork, I happened to see the um, Twilight Zone episode with Cliff Robertson and the dummy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that terrified me and I realized I have to know how these things work. How are they making them talk? Um, and so I, I asked my parents for a ventriloquist dummy. I got, they got me, you know, a $20 Mortimer snurd. Um, <laughs> like the, the, the goofiest, most gentle looking dummy you can imagine. Um, and uh, it had a pamphlet called Seven Simple Steps to Ventriloquism in it, ah. uh, which was no more than two pages long. Um, and went through the basics of of how to throw your voice um which turned out to be consonant abbreviation say instead of uh the big boy blew up the balloon you'd say the dig toy blew up the balloon it, um all, all of the the consonants that you have to use uh by moving your lips um you substitute with other ones that can be made to sound similar enough to fool people into thinking you're saying uh, uh, something comprehensible. That's so, that, that works. so that's how it works. Um, and, and meanwhile, in 2000, and uh, just uh, briefly, uh, you know, I, I I was a natural with um, with ventriloquism. Uh, it came very easily to me. And pretty soon I started doing, I was already in theater um, in the local community. Um, mm -hmm. So I started uh, doing shows, you know, originally, you know, talent shows. I started, I started winning things. I, I, I uh, and I upgraded my ventriloquist dummy at a certain point. Once I got to be about 12, um, <laughs> I started doing birthday parties, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, little variety shows about town. Uh, so finally, when I was 15 years old, I, I, don't, I don't remember how, but I, I found a company, a national company that created professional ventriloquist dummies. And I made a pitch to my local bank and they loaned me the money to buy uh, him. And I've still got him. <laughs> oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, he's he's the dummy that's in the collection, actually, uh, Reggie McCraskill. Oh, uh, that's awesome. And uh, and so, meanwhile, back in two thousand and four, I, I I thought to myself, well, let me rethink this whole thing, and with with seven simple steps to ventriloquism in mind, and what would happen if I wrote this as kind of an instructional manual, um, mm -hmm. slash personal confession of a ventriloquist um, who may or may not be losing his mind um, mm -hmm. and uh, extend it beyond the seven steps and see what happens. So I created out an outline um, and it went, it went right up to uh, the, the plane crash at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and I sent it to Ligotti and for the first time I got, really encouraging positive feedback from him. <laughs> he, he came back with, you know, this would make a great story. That's awesome. Um, and so there, there it was, that was, that was the beginning of what it would become. And then okay. came, then I, I didn't know it at the time, but then came the really hard part because <laughs> I had to take that, that good outline uh, and translate it into a, a good story and I didn't know how to write a good story so so I started trying to and then it, then there was a course of of years with some time off in between but uh very intense months of just going back and forth every day with mm -hmm. you know, 
Ligotti trying to guide me, um, but still completely hands off, uh, but basically just responding to everything that I was sending him. Uh, and it was very, very difficult. It was very hard. And finally, um, uh, the, the finished product was actually called The Secret of Ventriloquism. Mm -hmm. And it was about a 14 or 15,000 word story. Um, and uh, uh, Joe Pulver, um, who's a fantastic author and editor in his own right, was doing a Ligotti anthology called the, the Grim Scribes Puppets. Mm -hmm. And um, and he invited me to it. Um, uh, he caught wind of uh, of this story, and uh, the only problem is it had a five thousand word limit, and this thing was you know almost fifteen thousand words. So he sat on it a long time because he he liked it and wanted to use it, but it was just too long. So I decided to take all of the characters out of the story and pare it down as much as possible. Um, and what that resulted in was 20 simple steps to ventriloquism. And that was the, the definitive version. And that was about 2013. Uh, what a crazy the, the process. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a, it, it was a humbling process as well. You sure, know, because, of course. <laughs> My only goal that whole time was to write one good horror story. Mm -hmm. And I thought that once I had finished with that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't need to do anything else. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because I, I never considered myself to be in all of that time. I never considered myself to be a writer. I just wanted to do this one thing. And then once I, I did it, I, I guess I, I caught the bug, you know, uh, other, <laughs> ideas, other ideas started coming to my head. Extensions of, uh, of the story started kind of infecting me. Um, sure. And, and that's, and that's where the other stories in the collection came from. But and 20 Steps to Ventriloquism was, mm -hmm. was always the hub of those, uh, of everything that came afterwards. Uh, well, I, that's I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but I, I feel like I read somewhere that William Faulkner said he was going to write as I lay dying in six weeks, uh, or as fast as he could, just so it could, that it would stand for him if he died. Like he wanted to leave something behind that just represented everything he could do. <laughs> right. So it, it feels like you were like, I'm going to achieve this one goal. And then it just grew. Yeah. From the, yeah. Right. From the core. Yeah, that, exactly that. And, and, you know, the other stories became, it, it's strange because, you know, I never intended, uh, you, you know, I, I started thinking soon after uh, the, ver the version of 20 Simple Steps was, was finished that, you know, I'd like to have a collection um, and, and started thinking about other stories. But I never thought at the time that they would be so intimately connected to each other. It wasn't, mm -hmm. until, it wasn't until I'd written, I mean, the, the long piece in the collection, the infusorium was always, um, always had some connection. It, in, a, in a sense, it was a sequel to 20 Simple Steps to Ventriloquism, mm -hmm. the long version. No, um, yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, the, before we move off 20 Steps, I just have a couple specific, the one of the things that really jumped out of me that I liked was that if you just pulled the, the step numbers and then the words in quotes, it, it, the story is in, in, basically innocuous all the way through, right? So like literally the heading is like you did it or, <laughs> right? Like, like, right. There's no, there's no real giveaway in the title. Some of them are verging on sinister with like, you know, ignore the animal dummies or whatever, right? But they're not, they're, they're not full on terror. Right. But the 20th step has no heading. Is that on purpose? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, I, I thought about um, and, and, you know, that's 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 a very uh, that's a very perceptive question, I, you know, because the the headings at the beginning of each step really kind of 
to me, it did, did two things. One, it tied it into um, kind of the style of a manual um, in, in which, uh, you know, vari various steps to uh, accomplish any kind of task would be broken down and kind of, uh, kind of a, a bland, uh, friendly, but otherwise toneless manner. Um, mm -hmm. uh, almost as, almost as if, uh, a voice was, uh, um, um, kind of, uh, proclaiming what we are going to do next. And once, once, um, step 19 is over with ultimate ventriloquism, it's clear that there is no more need for that construct. I mean, we've, the, the, the writer and the reader has, and ostensibly the, the ventriloquist has gotten um, far beyond that. I mean, literally the greater ventriloquists are catatonics. So there, there is no need for, for um, um, that construct. That makes, it's, that makes it, sense. It, 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 like the, the head itself is useless now um, and can be discarded. Uh, and, and I felt like, and I felt like leaving a, a blank space there would be um, where the heading, where the heading would be. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 that that the, the blank space itself would be more powerful than anything that I could write there um, at that point in, in the story. At least that that was my that was uh, what I was going for. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's that's what that's what I suspected. But I just found that interesting that it, that something that wasn't there was so startling. Right. Well, one one of the things I really love about your collection is that. Um, I, Nick and I were talking about this when I told him about the book originally was your end lines for a lot of the stories are just so good, like so almost surgical, <laughs> right? Like, and there's something that the interesting happens in writing where, where the, the language can be really plain, but the sentence picks up all the implications of everything that came before it. Right. So like the story where the, the brother or the brothers are going to kill each other and they kind of trade off, right? Like that last sentence is such a, is so astonishing, <laughs> right? Um, but that's the thing is like, um, you know, in in like a Ligotti story, the notes on writing horror, the last sentence is so plain. It's, um, but when, when the time came, I found it all so easy, right? But it just carries all the weight of everything that you did before, right? So the question is, do you know the last line in advance of writing it? Are you planning for that effect? That's that's another great question. And um, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> not, not usually. Um, it, it, in the case of, of that particular story, which originally was called Sam, um, but which uh, was retitled, uh, I, I ultimately wasn't happy with that title. Um, uh, I had a lot of trouble with the, the third act of that story. Um, especially the, the, uh, the, the final, uh, paragraphs. Um, you know, originally there was an, there was more of a supernatural implication, uh, involving Sam that maybe, you know, he actually did succeed in taking over the protagonist. Um, and, and, and that just fell flat. Um, I tried all sorts of different, uh, um, uh, different ways of wrapping that story up. Um, and, and, and ultimately, uh, I realized that it all came down that it, I was making things more complicated than they should be. Um, and, and that, that really, um, I needed to simplify. Uh, and, and that's, you know, in kind of the post writing editorial work that I did on it, that's, that's probably the most 
profound lesson. Um, you know, it's, it, it's like Stephen King says in, on writing, you know, you, if, if you're not cutting at least somewhere in the vicinity of 10% of what you've written, then there's something wrong um, it, you know, by the finished product. Uh, simplify and clarify. That was, that was mm -hmm. one of the hardest parts to me um, uh, editorially. And, and that in, in the ending of that particular uh, story um, is an excellent example of that. In, in the end, it's the story in and of itself is about the relationship between um, these two brothers uh, and the, the violence um, that uh, grows between them. Um, and, and, and of course, the, the shift in their power positions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so, so th that, uh, that ending line um, really, uh, really came to me late uh, in the process. And it's such such plain language, but it's so powerful. And that's thank you. Know, you, thank you. You, you, can know, tell, you can tell something was taken out of it. You know, I think it was Edward Arlington Robinson or someone who said he spent eight hours writing and someone was like, what did you write? And he said, I spent four hours putting a colon in and four hours taking it out. <laughs> it's hard. To, it's almost right. It's got to be as hard to take stuff out that you've worked so hard on writing. Yeah. But, well, you, you know, it it's it's odd because uh, there's some things that come really easily and 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 quickly. Like for instance, um, uh, the the story Organ Void. Um, that one. I was literally sorry. I was literally about to ask you that because that's th there's a closed loop thing that happens with your stories where like the beginning line is what's missing this moment and the end line is nothing's missing this moment. Like literally. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. So, yeah. There, there, sorry, there, is, there is a kind of bookend there. Mm -hmm. and, which sometimes I avoid, but sometimes I embrace, you know, mm -hmm. um, sure. uh, the, the other story that came easily and quickly um, with, with not an incredible amount of revision work uh, was Escape to Thin Mountain, uh, mm -hmm. the last piece. Um, so it, it really just depends. And then there, there are other stories like the Infusorium where, I mean, there it didn't take me 20 years to write, but it did <laughs> it did take me about four um, it, it just wrestling with that that thing. Um, you know, I, you know, and by then, uh, you know, I, I'd finished uh, or, or, you know, I started the Infusorum in the late 2000s. And uh, and when I when I started writing the Infusorium, um, and, and, and that one just, uh, that, that was the first one that I was largely on my own for, you know, I, mm -hmm. in the, in the, you know, Ligotti was not, I wasn't like sending drafts to Ligotti for him to look at and say, this doesn't work. This does work. I was doing it on my own. So that was, that was a learning process in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but I mean, similarly to the brother story, um, murmurs, murmurs of a voice for known, I had just a hell of a time getting the ending right. I mean, endings are hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, especially when you've got a lot of moving parts, um, as, as I did with the infusorium. <laughs> well, that's interesting to me that it's, that it's, it seems like it, I mean, I'm only seeing finished product, right? So it seems more roadmapped than, than that. And that's like one of the things that jumped out to me was out to me from the, the collection as a whole was there's an element of kind of working through a process that's in a lot of the stories, right? Like in Oregon Void, she's listening to like kind of the self-improvement messaging. You're working through the 20 steps to get to the ventriloquism thing. The brothers are working through a power dynamic in their relationship where it shifts over, right? Like there, there's people working through a process. So it seems like you kind of would know where that would end, <laughs> but obviously that's not how that works. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think a lot of, I, I think a lot of that aspect was uh, unconscious on, on my part. Um, you know, it, I mean, all of that is, is 
uh, sounds true and fascinating, um, but I, I wasn't thinking about that at the time. Um, you know, a lot of this uh, came about unconsciously. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was just, um, and, and that's kind of the mystery of, of, um, of fiction writing. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure poetry uh, as well as prose, um, you know, you, the, the author, you, you know, how, how, how much is the author led by um, unconscious thought as opposed to, um, you know, voluntary uh, um, uh, conscious thought. Sure. It's like there was that there's that famous the Pushkin thing where he wrote a letter to someone saying you're never going to believe what Eugene did today and Eugene's like his fictional character <laughs> the author getting taken by surprise by his own creation yeah, right absolutely um and, and and you know that that was the um I mean I think that the the back material in the book at one point says something to the effect of you know uh that um, there, there is an effort to um, achieve salvation from the self uh, or, or existence mm -hmm. uh, um, through the, the process that you, that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, all of these stories. Uh, and, 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 and that, you know, looking back is really, is, is really true. You know, each of the stories uh, has protagonists that that fight um, in one way or, or the other with uh, compulsive thinking. Mm -hmm. it, it it becomes a real you know there there's there there's a re, there's a a pull in every one of the stories uh, uh, towards um, you know a complete emptiness of of self which you can which you know you can think in um uh the positive as well as the negative senses and and, and, that, and that really interests me as as a writer um you know kind of uh buddhist philosophy um the, uh, but looking on the flip side of it uh you yeah. know the 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 idea but still, you know, and that's a, a lot of this, you know, there, there were lots of influences um, uh, present in this book, not, not, not just Ligotti or, or the usual suspects like Lovecraft, but um, um, one of my primary influences was Eckhart Tolle, the, the guy who did The Power of Now. I don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. Sure, of course. With his stuff, but, you know, this, this idea that um that we are uh, essentially shells of a, of um containing a, a higher consciousness um in, you know, which, which um uh is not a new concept but uh it's one that in his work he makes very very explicit and and repeats over and over again. And uh, I, I, see, I see that element heavily uh, throughout the, 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 the manuscript. Um, sure. And, and uh, you know, I, I guess a lot of horror writers um, write about transformations, you know. I mean, from Livia Llewellyn to Laird Barron, um, mm -hmm. Uh, you, you know that oftentimes protagonists go through a profound change, in, especially in weird or, or horror fiction. Um, but I, you, you know, I was I was hoping uh, in in some of these stories at least, and, and in the whole and in the collection as a whole to uh, kind of speak to that that idea of. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the self as, as a, as a construct, as a dummy, if you will. 
Well, and it's interesting because that concept can be either soothing or horrifying, depending on <laughs> what you're doing with it, right? Definitely, and it and it and it is um, it, it it is both, I think, in in reality, because you know here uh, it it's a paradox, um, and and that's one of the things that I wanted to uh, establish very early on. That's why I started with. Um, the mindfulness of horror practice, um, mm -hmm. which from the get go is basically just a, a mindfulness of breathing practice turned on its head. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And it's something that should be soothing, but it, you take it in a really <laughs> yeah, dark, yeah. Through a dark oh, direction. And, and I, I remember when I, when I first had the idea to do that, you know, um, uh, me and, and my wife, uh, we, we've been New Orleanians since 2001. So uh, we went through Katrina and, and um, uh, we did fortunately evacuate for that, but we were, uh, we lived through um, uh, returning and, and uh, uh, all of the, the years after that, which I'm sure figured in big uh and uh what this manuscript became but um mm -hmm. uh, um you know that those years were so stressful for everyone who lived here um and and, and of course those that couldn't get back as well um and, and one of the things that i did to cope my my friend actually matt carden uh recommended um that i uh, a look into Tolle's work, and B mm -hmm. um, start a mindfulness of breathing practice, uh, and I did so, and and uh, and I started uh, meditating uh, every day. Um, so when I was thinking about uh, the what would become the mindfulness of horror, I you know I actually started with the title of that. Because you know, it struck me. There's got to be, there's got to be somebody who, who has, ha has developed some kind of mindfulness of horror practice. <laughs> you know, sure. It just seems like I, I mean some fictional piece or, or something out there, and I was surprised that there wasn't. So I, I, that's why I had to write it. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, um, <laughs> and ultimately, you know, that piece, um, I think um, the, the reason I, I, I wrote it was because uh, um, I, I was entering, I entered into um, pseudopods flash fiction contest with it. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the two pieces that I, that uh, I, I um, submitted one was a very stripped down version of the indoor swamp and the other was the mindfulness of horror practice and it actually uh was one of the the top three winners um the final oh, cool. there are three winners um and it was it was one of them um so uh, that was the that was the second pseudopod um uh, story that i had published um and well, it's a great way to start a collection because it just is going to keep the reader on their toes from the jump, right? Like you're not, you're breaking format. You're not going to, right? This isn't going to be the usual kind of journey through a, through a set of stories, which I think is awesome. Do you, do you, because of your background with audio and the ventriloquism and all that, do you hear the characters when you're writing them? Do you, is voice influencing how it would be sound read out loud? Is that something that you have in mind? with the flow of it? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think so. You know, I, I, I do, um, I do read my work aloud. Uh, usually not until I've got a finished draft, but, um, the musicality of, um, uh, of the prose is, is important to me. Um, and, um, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I've, I've got a theater background. I started in mm -hmm. theater when I was seven years old and 
between the time that I was seven and 21, I was constantly in some play. I, I, I was in a production more often than not. Um, mm -hmm. I got my bachelor's degree in, in theater arts and actually made a go of it in New York City for a couple of years um, before, you know, it ate me and spewed me back out. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, all this to say, uh, yeah, I, 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 um, as I'm writing, I can, uh, I can hear it in my, in my mind. Uh, um, and I hear the voices, uh, in my imagination, uh, very, very, um, distinctly. That's cool. And that, well, and this always fascinates me when talking to people who write, quote unquote horror fiction, like is the, are the fright elements intentional or are they organic? Like, are there, is there the literary equivalent of a jump scare or is it just a, a byproduct of, of what story you're trying to tell? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I don't think, I mean, looking back, I don't think that I, I have ever intentionally tried to create a, a scene um, to scare. Um, I, 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 and, but at the same time, I never, you know, there, there's part of me that, that um, really feels like uh, I, I'm writing I'm not intentionally even writing horror or, or weird. I, I just, that's what comes out. <laughs> you know? uh, it, sure. It's a, it's a, it's a strange, it's a strange phenomenon. Uh, on the other hand, there, there have been times like with the infusorium where I realized that, um, uh, you, you know, there's the, the scene where uh, detective Tosto um, confronts uh Solomon Croft uh, in his home, and mm -hmm. which, which leads to Croft's death, um, and, and uh, that that scene came late. But when I was writing it, I didn't really know what was going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it is a lot of it um, is organic. Um, there, there's there's a lot of processing and editing after the fact usually uh -huh. especially with that story um but it uh i, I no i don't i don't consciously yeah, that's that's kind of what i thought you would say and that's that's the there's a i'm a, a big fan of a band called uh, throwing muses and they um they they thought they were kind of like a homage surf party band but they're a dark alternative like whatever band so the first time they played out when they were done they th they were playing what they thought were party songs and the audience was just horrified <laughs> and then they realized what kind of band they actually were <laughs> right because sometimes it's just that's how it comes out right <laughs> yeah, yeah well that's and and you know that's the reason why uh i mean uh, my attempts at writing before i i read Ligotti. I mean, there were some, um, but I just, I, I didn't know what I, I didn't know how to express myself. Um, um, and, and so there were a lot of aborted attempts of writing kind of comedic, almost like Woody Allen-esque um, uh, stories and uh, just these abortive efforts that didn't go anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. once I read him, I realized, you know, yes, I understand this, not from, not from the perspective of a writer, but as from the perspective of, of a human being who has had these, these kind of thoughts and sure. uh, on a deeper level, a subtextual level. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, and I, and I think everybody who writes kind of, you know, eventually finds their voice. It took me. Right. Cause, cause I, I feel like when you're reading Stephen King and you come to a sh the shining room 237 scene, that's scene is crafted to scare on purpose, right? Like I, that could be wrong, but it feels like, like he has elements that are just placed 
for, but it, that's what I mean is it's, it's right. But that's what works for him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, it's sort of like the difference between technical actors and method actors, you know, the technical actors like sure. for Lawrence Olivier are, you know, uh, wailing in the, in the storm scene <laughs> in the air and, and, pondering what he's going to have for breakfast the next day. <laughs> and, and, and then on the other flip side, you've got, um, <laughs> you've got Dustin Hoffman and the marathon man um, staying up for five days straight and not eating anything uh, <laughs> to prepare himself for this grueling, you know, dental scene. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's whatever works whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about just the, the horror field? Like, have you read or seen anything really intriguing lately? And, and sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, there, obviously for some years now, we've been hearing a lot about, you know, kind of the, the golden age of weird fiction. And I think uh, I, I'm ambivalent about that, that idea. I think that as usual, um, as in any period of time, there is work that's out there that that's out there that is exceptional. Um, there's a, a lot more work out there that's kind of typical, um, and uh, some of it well written, some of it not. Um, but I, but I think that one of the um, kind of advantages of the information age that we're in is it does make it possible for certain uh, authors to, to get read that might not have ever gotten, been read, you know, initially uh, uh, 20 years ago, or if they had gotten read, they would have had to have, they would have been on a trajectory more like Ligotti where, mm -hmm. you know, he labored under obscurity for the first 10 years of his of his writing life actually many more than that he just um he, he was kind of similar uh i mean he's he's in a class by himself but he, mm -hmm. he's similar to me in that he wrote for a long time without publishing anything um mm -hmm. and he threw away everything that he wrote until he re uh wrote uh the last piece of harlequin but when I see somebody like uh, Matthew Bartlett, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, just appeared on the, the scene uh, with a, a, a book that, that he published himself, but that just, you know, took the weird fiction community by storm because it was so damn great. <laughs> um, um, that is that is inspiring you know it, it, and it really is and and i think and i think but on the other hand i think that we have we have some really exceptional uh writers um uh that that are that are writing right now um like for instance uh christopher slatsky um who you know so far has has only been published by by small press, and in the the hardcore weird fiction world is very well known. But you know this guy, you know he should be a, a superstar right now. He should be, you know, and 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 um, you and you're seeing. But I, I guess I guess the good thing is that like with Slatsky, you know, as, as with Bartlett, I, you know, I, I, I think, I think that in the age that we're in, because we're so interconnected with, with one another, both as readers and as writers, that really exceptional work will come to the forefront sooner rather than later in this day and age. And I'm not sure that that was possible uh, in, in the same way um, before the internet and before social media. So that, that, that is a real positive.
that's encouraging. <laughs> that's that's what I hope to hear. Yeah, <laughs> because that's the thing with the social media. Since I'm doing it for our podcast, like I, I noticed that just the quality of responses and the engagement was higher than I would have suspected, and um, I couldn't identify why. But it really is just an aggregation of a lot of good sources funneling into one stream, right? So like, I don't think that pro would have existed in that way before, which is, which is great to see. <laughs> it is. Uh, there, there are, you know, there, there, there are certain writers though, they're like Slatsky or, or SP Miskowski is, is another one who mm -hmm. is writing exceptional uh, Southern Gothic work. Um, um, like nobody else is writing uh, and it, you know it's almost it's almost frustrating sometimes to see um the, these writers that are getting some attention but you know you you hope that they that they'll that they'll break into a wider readership because they're just they're they're, they're just that good sure and and yeah absolutely and it would be inspiring to other writers who could be of equal quality to see their work go to the next level. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and there, there are plenty of those as well. And, and uh, you know, I've been very, you know, there's a lot of drama in, in, in any writer world, um, <laughs> whether you're dealing with poets or, or prose writers, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with folks that, that uh, are, are more likely to be depressed. Um, there are people who are more likely to have anxiety problems uh, and social issues. And, um, and, and I'm, you know, uh, I'm one of them. <laughs> um, so all, all of this to say, you know, in the past couple of years since I've really jumped into uh, social media, I have for the most part been kind of blown away by the um, the warmth um, and the uh, acceptance uh, that I've received from uh, the, the weird fiction community in particular. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, yeah it, and it's not something that I expected i expected that it would be very very difficult to um, uh, interact and, and you know and again the, there are always a handful in any in uh any group that will have problems uh periodically but i you know i haven't had i haven't had any huge drama uh in, in, at least yet <laughs> in the, <laughs> in the, in the, that's a big surprise you know? <laughs> well no well and w that's how i actually discovered you in social media and that's i mean i used to discover people like legati through like short horror fiction collections from you know people like datlow or etchison or whoever but grant grants right but but now it's more likely than not that i find something that i enjoy through the digital presentation of it which is you know and i'm glad i found you because i love your work and speaking of because we have to wrap up i'm i'm curious of speaking of interconnected um how what are you up to next and how do people find you connect with you find your book what's your preferred sure sure well right now probably the 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 best way to uh the versions of the book that are readily available now uh, are uh, in paperback format, trade paper, um, in Kindle format uh, for only, I think, I forget what it is, $3.99, I think. Um, and uh, in uh, audio format through Amazon or Audible. Uh, all, all of those versions actually can be purchased through Amazon um and, and uh elsewhere um but certainly those uh that's the easiest the, the, <laughs> the easiest source um the audio version um i'm particularly fond of because i 
I produced and, and narrated it myself. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Cool. So, so it, yeah. And, and that was, that was kind of a intense experience <laughs> <laughs> because I, I didn't have much time to, to, uh, uh, do it. I only had a few days in which I had to do it, but I had a lot of time. Uh, um, I was in Tampa, Florida. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I stayed up very late. It was during a, a, a business conference um, that I was attending. And so I stayed up very late every night <laughs> doing this thing for hours and hours. Uh, in editing and uh, you know doing a lot of post production work as well, uh, but you know I, I'm I'm very happy with the way that turned out, and I I think that the audio version um, uh, adds a different dimension. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's better than the 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 text on the page, but it's definitely different. It's worthwhile. Um, cool. And so, uh, all that being said, uh, right now I'm recharging my batteries, <laughs> you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm writing, uh, but right now I'm kind of in the, the notes phase or the you sure. know, data collection phase. Um, I, I have, uh, I think four stories that I'm working on, uh, right now that are in very early stages. I, I, uh, I think three of them are uh, going to be in anthologies um, in the future. Uh, one of them is a Pulver anthology. The other two I can't talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of them is, uh, one story is going to uh, be in uh, issue zero of Zenoibus from Dunham's Manor Press as well. Oh, cool. um, they're they're yeah. such a great press. Yeah, yeah, I really, really lucked out when when I uh, contacted Jordan Crawl. Um, you know, because you're good at you're good at contacting people. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guess the email and get it right? <laughs> Speaking of, Nick's been trying to guess your email and email you through this whole show. Have you got anything? We're just curious. Uh, <laughs> We're not as good at guessing emails as you are at guessing Legatis. Yeah, well, that was, that, that <laughs> was just uh, me figuring out where he worked. <laughs> <laughs> that's where we're. That's where we failed, Nick. We yeah, we, that's we're... that was the missing link. <laughs> uh, that's cool. I have not gotten anything yet. <laughs> okay, we failed. Right, that's fine. But I'll be happy oh, to give you. Mike. We're, we're... <laughs> no, I appreciate that. That's awesome. All right. Well, this has been fantastic. We're going to include links to everything uh, when we publish the episode. And we're encouraging everyone to go out and check out the book because it's really, really spectacular and, and unique. Uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, you, you know, the, the, other, the other thing that um, you might want to link to as well, mm -hmm. um, uh, I I um, have, you know, be, even before the the writing bug, I, I was... Oh, Legati uh, Online? I was... Re yeah, yeah. I, um, so Legati.net is Thomas Legati Online, um, which is a much larger community than it sounds like. Um, there are, I think at this point, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 3,500, 4,000 members, something like that. And uh, at any given time, there are usually about 50 or 60 people on uh, talking about a wide variety of subjects. Um, That's awesome. Not, not just related to Thomas Lucati, uh, but but uh, it's it, it's a community that's really grown. Uh, it's been a, a, a wonderful thing. And, and you know, um, I've also, on YouTube, you can probably find some uh, Legati stories that I've recorded as well uh, that I've been allowed to, to um, oh, cool. uh, oh, cool. put out there, like the Bungalow House, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I'm particularly uh, fond of, um, and uh, a few other things. Uh, recently, I, I re-recorded a, a version of uh, one of my favorite stories um, 
uh, by Conrad Aiken, Silent Snow, Secret Snow. Mm -hmm. um, He's a great writer. And that, yeah, yeah, he really was. Um, and that's available as well. So Okay, well, we will definitely link to all that because I, I actually remember where I was when I first read uh, Ligotti's notes on the writing of horror, and I remember smiling to myself, and it's weird. <laughs> it's weird that you can remember a detail so far back. I was literally on a second floor of a library and when you can remember the first time you encountered a writer, that's a signal that they're doing something really special. So yeah, I agree. Very cool. awesome. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you, John. We appreciate you taking the time. Um, Thanks so much guys. I really appreciate it.